Well, in this lecture, I want to begin talking about a different kind of defect in crystals. So we've talked previously about point defects, uh, right, vacancies and interstitials and substitutionals. What I want to talk about in this lecture is a is a kind of a unique type of defect called a dislocation. And um, let's I'm going to try to introduce this a little slowly uh, as we go forward. So to begin with, I want to talk about plastic deformation in crystal structures. So the question I want to pose is, how can plastic deformation in a crystal structure occur? So remember what, what we mean by plastic deformation. Plastic deformation means permanent deformation. So it's not fracture. What it means is that we took and um, we bent a, a piece of metal, for example, and it stayed bent, right? That's plastic deformation. Um, and how does that happen atomically? Um, you might also ask the question, why do metals have a yield strength? Why is it that at some point we pull on them and, and uh, they begin to yield, right? They begin to stretch permanently. Um, and, you know, you probably have, have maybe seen in other courses, or if not, you will soon, people use things like von Mises stress to predict the onset of yielding. So wh why is that? What, what, what's happening? We're not going to derive it here. But if we look at the theoretical strength just required to uh, break the bonds apart and try to base our strength of a material on how, how much um, the bond itself could resist, we would find that, on, that the, the strength of the material should be on the order of 10% uh, of the elastic modulus. So let's just, for example, steel is, has a modulus of roughly 200 GPA, which would suggest that um, that the theoretical strength of steel should be about 20 GPA. I can tell you that steel's strength is nowhere near 20 GPA. Uh, if you can get to two, uh, you're doing pretty well. So, so we're talking an order of magnitude less than what we'd expect. And so, in fact, all materials are like this. Uh, the observed yield strength and the observed fracture strength in real materials are between 0 0.001 and 0 0.01 times the elastic modulus. So, why are real strengths 10 to 100 times lower than predicted theoretically just on the bond strength? So in the case of fracture, uh, we need to talk about fracture mechanics to, to understand that. We're not going to talk about that here. But on the yield side, um, we, we, that's, what, that's where we uh, need to introduce this concept of dislocations. Um, so let me, let me just start with a, a thought experiment. And it's, it's only a thought experiment because I'm going to tell you how it's going to run. You, you, you wouldn't be able to predict it a priori. But let's take the deformation of a single crystal of zinc. In this case, it's going to be hexagonal, closed packed. So here is our undeformed uh, tensile bar. And if we pull on it, what we observe is that we end up with uh, these what look like nicely oriented planes that this um, one material has slipped relative to the other on. And in fact, we call those slip steps uh, um, during the deformation process. And if we look at the, an experimental uh, image of this, uh, we could, that's exactly what we see. You can see that somehow deformation took place and looks like they slipped on these planes. So that is how plastic deformation occurs in a metal. Um, and so I want to just reiterate that. So yielding, that's the plastic, the, the plastic deformation that remains, that this is that permanent deformation. This occurs by slipping atomic planes over one another, right? So it, that, that's how the deformation remains permanent. But the question about is that I want to pose to you is how do, how does that happen? How does one plane uh, slide over the other, right? You'd think that if the, 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 um, all the bonds broke, for example, then you just have a fracture. You have two pieces. But somehow, one plane slides over the other one and then still retains effectively the same uh, stiffness as it had before it slid. So how does it do that? What, what's the mechanism? And the mechanism is actually a dislocation. Um, it's a dislocation is formally a one-dimensional defect. Um, so think of it as a line. Uh, it can be curved. It can be straight. Um, and it represents the relative slip between lattice planes. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a slip boundary. So on one side of the dislocation, uh, the crystal has slipped. On the other side, it hasn't. Okay. Historically, 
uh, dislocations were conceived of um, before we could see anything uh, with respect to them. To explain how atomic planes could shift relative to each other at stresses that were much lower than the theoretical strength. Okay, so I'm going to show you a picture of why this works. Okay, so this was proposed by Taylor in 1934, uh, obviously not with the animated uh, GIF back then, but what, what you're looking at is a, a perfect crystal structure and we're going to apply some shear to it, right? And we're going to slide one uh, one uh, uh, group of atoms over the other along a uh, plane, right? And so what's happening in this image, if you look at this upside down T, that represents a dislocation. And I said it's a line, it's actually a line into the screen. So it's a straight line into the screen, we're looking kind of at it in 2D. Okay, so what happens is that it doesn't, the, the way that we um, shift one group of atoms over another is we we move this dislocation on its slip plane and it basically goes through and breaks individual bonds at a time and then it rebonds them until at the until at the end of the deformation uh the crystal is slipped by one what's called a burgers vector which is the the quantif the, the 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 amount of slip that the dislocation brings okay so um that that's the, the fundamental idea behind uh, a dislocation and, and why it uh, and why it is now so what what you can kind of see from this image is that slipping of one plane relative to another requires shear stress on the plane so that's something that you can um, think about for for uh, dislocation motion uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute you can see here that even though what's really happening is that the crystal slipping, we kind of represent it as a dislocation moving through this crystal. And when it when it's done moving, it has shifted one plane relative to the other. That happens always in response to a shear stress. So if you have a perfectly hydrostatic stress or a perfect pressure stress, you actually won't get any um, uh, plastic deformation uh, because there isn't any shear stress to drive the dislocations. Okay. So I, right now, again, I'm I, I, um, having spent a large part of my career studying dislocations in specific. Uh, I, I know that they're a, a strange concept to come to grips with. And unfortunately, in this online format, it's a little hard to uh, show you the models that, that you can touch and feel and kind of see the 3D nature of them. Uh, so... I'm going to, I'm trying just to give you a flavor in this lecture. We're going to, in, in, in the next lecture, we'll start talking more specifically about um, definitions with respect to um, uh, dislocations. But this is just to get you an overall um, high level view of, of, of dislocations because I think most people have never seen them, don't even know, don't even know what they do or that they existed. Okay, so let's talk about experimental observation of dislocations. So this is a, a, a image from a transmission electron microscope, and and uh, from this is from a paper in 1997, uh, looking at uh, a nickel aluminum alloy, and what you can see is these dark lines. These are dislocations that exist in the in the um, material, and they they appear as lines. So they are in fact line defects. Um, I will tell you that it's not easy to look at dislocations, even with a transmission electron microscope. There's only a few, a handful of folks, I guess, in, in the world that I would consider that do it really well. Um, and it's not something that you're just going to see just uh, generally without being very, very specific about um, the, the control of your beam direction and, and uh, the, the crystal direction that you're looking at and those kinds of things. But bottom line is we can observe these um, in a transmission electron microscope. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to uh now move on to give you some uh, critical characteristics of dislocations. Um and I'm going to you're going to see this slide multiple times because I I don't expect you to become a dislocation expert by the end of class, but there are five uh critical features of dislocations or characteristics that you should be familiar with and aware of because it's going to affect how we talk about uh things like why we would do heat treatment, why we want to change the grain size, why we might include second phase particles, all of that actually, and I'll show you why later, all of that relates to uh, dislocations. <clears throat> so what I'm showing you here uh, is actually a, a simulation from a paper in Nature Materials. I actually just came out at the end of last year in 2020. 
and uh, what what you can see is that obviously we're compressing this uh, sample and and the what you're looking at in these with these green lines these are the dis, this dislocation structure that's evolving as we yield so here's your stress strain curve initial elastic and then it yields and as it's yielding we get a denser and denser uh, dislocation structure that emerges and then this is actually we haven't talked about this nor will we in the class but this is basically what's called a pole figure uh, showing you uh, how, how the crystal uh, is oriented as, as it, um, as it uh, deforms okay so here we go five critical characteristics of dislocations that you should remember okay number one dislocations have an associated stress field from lattice distortion okay so if I put a if you remember back to the uh, a couple slides ago where I showed you that dislocation moving, right? If in the neighborhood of that dislocation, the lattice is warped, okay? And we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in future lectures. Uh, the second is that uh, dislocations can move in response to the stresses that a dislocation feels. So what you're seeing in, with all these green lines here, you were seeing a dislocation that was moving in response to an applied stress, okay? So they have a, they have a stress field, but they can also move in response to the stresses that they feel, uh, whether it's from an applied load or even other dislocations. Uh, they can interact with each other, and they can annihilate, repel, or form junctions. And that um, when dislocations slip, they give rise to, um, and dislocations move rather, they give rise to lattice slip, which is plastic strain. So when, when you're watching dislocations moving, that is plastic strain happening, okay? That's yielding happening. Um, and then finally, when plastic deformation uh, occurs, uh, dislocations are nucleating and multiplying. Um, and that's sort of what you saw as you saw this began as a relatively sparse structure over here and then moved to a, a more dense structure. So now that's all, I, that's all text I'm going to give you really. What I want to show you now is a series of movies both experimental and in simulation, to just give you a feel for what's happening as we cause a material to yield, okay? And so I'm going to ask that you look for these sort of three characteristics but from the movies. Number one, you wanna, you're want you going to see them moving. Uh, number two, you're going to see them interacting. And number three, you're going to see them uh, potentially nucleating and multiplying, okay? So let's talk about... Uh, Experimental observations of dislocation motion. This, so this is a nickel aluminum crystal. Uh, I'm going to show you here, and you'll be able to see these these dislocation lines moving through the material under a stress. I know it's a little blurry, but you can see that dislocation line as it marches through the material. That is what's happening uh, when we're causing something to yield. We're moving dislocations through. Um, Something else to be aware of is that dislocations can also hit obstacles and be impeded, or they can be uh, they can push through them. They can be re-emitted, right? Um, you can also see here that some dislocations aren't moving and others are, but it's actually a very complex um, uh, behavior and mechanism. It's not easy to simulate. Um, and and again, I'm I'm showing you specifics here, but we're not gonna we're not gonna model this uh, with the same level of precision that we might, let's say, talking about a equilibrium vacancy concentration or something. Okay, so here's a movie. This is a transmission electron microscope movie. Uh, here's another uh, movie that is shows kind of similar features. You can see under yielding that these dislocations are sort of marching through the material, but as they do, they're causing slip. They're slipping one plane over another plane, and that's causing permanent deformation, okay? This is uh, something to note here. What you can kind of see is these loops growing, and then they keep growing out of the same spot, okay? That's that's actually a, a, probably a dislocation source. So you're seeing dislocations being nucleated there um, as the... As the um, load progresses so the nucleating means we're, we're we're creating a new dislocation and moving it and then creating another one and moving it um so that's that's what you're looking at uh, in this in this image okay now i'm going to move to uh, uh this is a little bit of a different picture this is uh, uh a thin aluminum 011 bicrystal so now you can use now you have the information you know what uh parentheses tells you that's a plane what the, an 011 uh, crystal means is that the 011 plane is oriented out of the film. So that's the surface. Um, the way this was created was the 
the aluminum is deposited on a silicon wafer and and then we generate stresses um, via mismatching thermal expansion right the aluminum expands at a different rate than the silicon wafer and so as we change the temperature we can generate stresses so this is actually created um, by another uh, when I was uh, by by one of my colleagues and and my uh, former former PhD advisor uh, uh, years ago uh, so this was some of the work that my, my group was involved in even though I wasn't directly involved in it so I'll just highlight for you here uh, here, if you look in this part of the screen, this is where your temperature is, okay? And you can start, you can see in this uh, crystal, uh, you can see dislocation lines moving. And one thing that you'll kind of note is that they, uh, sometimes they move in bursts. So they're not always a consistent uh, set of motion. So they might move, be held up by an obstacle, and then break free from that obstacle. And when they do, they kind of burst as they go out, okay? Um so, uh, so the, what, what's happening here is that we're decreasing the temperature, which is increasing the, the stress. Okay, so we started at uh, three three sixty or something like that. So we're we're increasing the stress here, and soon we're going to move to now uh, jump considerably to a, lo a lower temperature. Now we're at two hundred eighty one uh, degrees, and you can just see these dislocations moving, and then there's a burst, and then there's not much motion, and then another burst. Okay, so you can kind of see again. I, you're not going to be able to model these explicitly, um, because but but I want you to just be aware of what's happening in a real material when yielding occurs. Okay. Now we're down to 84 degrees. Uh, we're not going to watch this whole video, but but I wanted you to just to be aware of that that this is this is widely observed, um, and it's something that um, that we that we know exists, even if. Uh, we're not always able to predict every feature of it. One thing I just think you just saw there was a rapid burst of lots of dislocations. Um, that's called a dislocation avalanche. Um, and, and those sometimes occur also during yielding. So one thing that you should take away from this is that the yielding of metals or the yielding of crystals in general is a tremendously complicated um, uh, problem. Okay? Okay. So if you remember the image that I showed you uh, at the, the very first movie I showed you when I listed the five characteristics of dislocations, uh, one thing that you'll see in this video is this is from the same group out of uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory from 06. Uh, what, what you're looking at here is a 3D simulation of a dislocation structure evolving. And what you can see is it forms this very complex network as the deformation takes place. So obviously you're not looking at the material, now you're only looking at the... Um, the dislocation uh, structure that's 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 uh, forming as the de as the deformation progresses, but you can uh, kind of get a sense for what's happening in a metal uh, when when you deform it. And we're going to talk in future lectures about how 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 much how many dislocations are in there. How long is if we had the one line of dislocations, how long would it be? And I think it's going to be a shockingly high number. Um, so this just gives you, like I say, a little bit of a uh, just a visual of of uh, what is going on inside a metal when we yield it and uh, and we're going to use this to, to try to understand how we can strengthen metals okay uh, two more videos uh, this is a this is specifically focusing on a junction in a film so this is uh, there's a couple dislocations here at the film interface which you can't see and we're driving a dislocation into them that's what we're looking at here and in this case there's an annihilation reaction here and here and they come back and it turns out we've now we've got a new uh, dislocation on that exists on uh, two different planes okay so that's just something that uh, again this this was work done um, uh, in my research group uh, when I was at Cornell and I'm just showing you the video and then I want to finish with with some of my own work so I this was work I did about um, the paper was 11 years ago but the work that was done was was longer ago than that I simulated uh, dislocations in, in thin films in particular. So this simulation you're looking at here is of a four micron by four micron um, in area film that's 200 nanometers thick and I, I'm using the properties of copper. And so, it, and so it's not allowed to, to, the dislocations are not allowed to exit the film. And so if you look at what happens, I'm looking at the types of dislocations. So the colors correspond to different kinds of dislocations. But what you can see is that, like in this case here, I formed a junction, right? 
Here I formed a junction. Here it looks like this red dislocation was blocked by this uh, green dislocation dipole. Um, so, and, and the way that this simulation was run was that I would apply a strain, hold it until the dislocation stopped moving, and then I would bump the strain up a discrete amount. And so you're going to see when I bump that strain up, there'll be a dislocation sort of explosion of motion right there. As a bunch of dislocations break free from the interactions, form new interactions, some interactions hold. Um, and the idea is here that this is actually creating a very complex stress state in the film. And it turns out if this was a silicon film, all these dislocations uh, would actually act as um, uh, almost uh, wires to short circuit um, uh, uh, semiconductor um, parts like uh, like microchips and so it turns out that one of the ways that we we um, one of the one of the critical features of dislocations uh, in the respect to the semiconductor industry is that they act as as um, uh, effects that basically destroy whatever microcircuit you're looking at so people like Intel and IBM are very interested in in trying to figure out ways to minimize the amount of dislocations that they have in their silicon structures because they cause um, these deleterious effects uh, in their in their circuits. So this this sort of gives you just over a high view, um, uh, high level view of dislocations uh, without any of the math behind it, without any of the complexity. Just you kind of can see what's happening, and I think it's new to you because I don't think you have ever seen this anywhere else. But this is what's happening when, when a crystal um, yields or deforms, okay?